Hello, this is David. And in this clip, I want to make the case that the teleology, that the purpose of the invasion of the distal spiral arteries by the extravillous trophoblast is really to create space for the placenta to grow. I alluded to this in my previous talk. And a lot of what I'm going to say today is based on a paper that I read today that really influenced me a lot. I think it's a beautiful paper. And it's, I never evaluate papers methodologically. I um, evaluate papers for how much their conceptualization resonates with me with what must be true and beautiful. And to me, that's how I evaluate papers. And so the paper is in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, volume 192, um, page 230, sorry, 323 to 32. It's the year 2005, and the author is uh, Jean-Pierre Schapp et al. And um, what the paper shows really is that it shows that in the past we used to think that the placenta is sort of like an avian astomosis. The placenta itself is an avian astomosis that links flow in the um, end arteries of the uterine artery, the spiral artery, and that it links that flow with the uterine vein, and that the placenta itself is functionally a big arteriovenous anastomosis. And the paper shows that that's not really the case. What the paper shows is that in pregnancy, what gets elaborated in the uterus is a big sort of arteriovenous anastomosis. The uterus itself sort of becomes a big arteriovenous anastomosis, and that the placenta gets hooked up with that arteriovenous anastomosis in parallel. So, you know, the uterine artery connects to an arcuate artery that runs basically along the outside, along the serosal aspect of the uterus. And then there are these radial arteries that plunge in and they terminate in the spiral artery. And it's been argued, for example, in a very nicely written and nicely um, modeled paper, that it's the opening up, it's the... And, and one of the big beliefs in our field, that it's the funnel-like opening of these spiral arteries that creates the flow pa properties or the rheology that, um, that, that determines the flow of the maternal blood into the placental circulation. And, th and, and, th and that also we know that this part, the arcuate artery part of the circulation, is where the resistance is. That's really where the resistance is. And the blood is flowing in here at around 80 millimeters of mercury. And here the resistance is quite low. This is a conduction system. It's been not a high resistance system. This portion after the green line, you know, at sort of the distal radial artery and spiral arteries have low resistances and high conduction. Fluid volumes are conducted. These, this could be likened and it was by like Dr. Mall. This was likened to an open tap, and this is this part is likened to an open tap, and this part could be likened to the to the plumbing that conduits to the tap. And um, people have argued that what creates the high conduction, low resistance here is the remodeling of the distal spiral arteries into a funnel-like shape. But what um, Sharp showed is that that's probably not the case. That what really creates the low resistance, high conduction um, circulation that goes into the placenta is the fact that these spiral arteries are highly, highly, highly connected by an arborizing network of vessels and not just artery to artery, it's artery to vein. So here, 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 there's a large arterial venous anastomosis, including connecting relatively large arteries and large veins. And so, and then that hooks up with the placenta sort of in parallel. And that's a nice model. And there's a lot of differences. And one of the differences it, the way I see it, and I could be wrong, is that this type of flow modeling would really be quite a pulsatile type of flow, whereas this type of modeling, if you have an AV anastomosis, is much more continuous. And I would suspect that the placenta would like a high conduction, low resistance, continuous model of flow, and that fits much better with a parallel model. Or at least I shouldn't say much better, because what right do I have to say it? I mean, what data do I even have? My intuition is that that's, a, that that's the model that, that speaks to my heart more. So, um, so the case I'd like to make is that, so then the question you might be asking, okay, David, um, if it's true that um, 
creating these spouts is not so important for the dynamics of blood entering into the placental maternal space, why do we see so much biological evidence of invasion of, inter and of, of, of extravillous trophoblast into the distal spiral arteries? What, what's the teleology of that then? And I would argue is that the teleology of that is actually creating the, sp the space where the placenta dwells. And also, it does link the placenta to this AVM thing, I'm going to call it, the, in, in honor of Schapp, I'm going to call it what he calls it, the myometriovascular network. And the links, the parallel links between the myometriovascular network and the placenta proper are created by extravillous trophoblast modeling, and also the extravillous trophoblast modeling creates the space that the placenta, that the villi actually enters and links it to this low resistance myometriovascular network. But that part, the spiral artery modeling, remodeling, is not what creates the low resistance, high, high, high flow rheology, uh, in other words, flow dynamics properties of the placenta itself. What creates that, and that's a point here, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit, what creates that, and that's another point that Schatt makes, is I'd like to accept Schatt's argument that the extravillous trophoblast, another population of them that invade much deeper, help the arterial venous malformation or the myometriovascular um, uterus form, but those are EVTs that invade much deeper, not into really the spiral artery, not into sort of the distal spiral arteries, but those that sort of get, you know, into the proximal spiral arteries and even the radial arteries. So there are intramyometrial extravillous trophoblasts, intramyometrial ones that invade and create this arterial venous malformation, but though they're not the one that you see in the placenta, they never come out with the placenta, they're, they're intramyometrial and they're, 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 they're left in the mother and they cause this remodeling that creates this arterial venous anastomosis. So by the way, Schapp showed beautifully, just underlies the placenta and doesn't exist in other portions of the uterus. And so yes, there I are these deep EVTs that help create this A AVM or myometriovascular anastomosis structure, and then the more superficial EVTs that we see in the radial artery that come out with the placenta, that come out with the scrapings that people are doing in their decidual samplings, those, um, those create the parallel links between the um, placental space, the maternal space of the placenta, and this sort of superficial plexus of AVM-like low-resistance vessels. But the hemodynamics of this AVM are created by deeper invading trophoblasts that are actually in the myometrium. And um, I just want to make one sort of almost linguistic point, and that is my contention that the EVTs, the extravillous trophoblasts that invade the superficial spiral arteries, actually create the space. And in that case, I want to use the word creation. They create the space for the placenta, and that's the space where the placenta grows. But the, the EVTs that invade deeper and help create this myometrial vascular, this myometrial vascular anastomosis, this AVM type of rheology, I, my sense is that they're not really remodeling and creating as much as the superficial EVTs are. What those deeper EVTs are, are really bringing out a latent capacity that existed in the uterus all along. The uterus always has this latent tendency to go into this physiological state of arterial venous shunt. And somehow these deeply evading EVTs coax out. It's not an act of creation. It's an act of bringing out a latent tendency. They bring out the latent tendency of the uterus, albeit focal, to become an AV shunt. But the EVT that invades superficially, that, that, that intermix with the superficial spiral arteries, that's an act of creation. That's really creating a space where the placenta is going to grow. So I start to allude to these arguments earlier. And one of the questions that was raised was that what I was saying was contrary to what people know from early embryology. And that is based on this model that we see in some of Dr. Burton who's the greatest 
of all in Dr. Burton's um, um, monographs, and we also see it in, in in some other monographs. And this sort of notion that you and notion that you have, you know, your inner cell mass and then your outer cell mass. This is your inner cell mass and then your outer cell mass, and that we start to see this fenestration, this lacunization, this labyrinthization of your extra villus trophoblast, and then it goes and invades the mother and invites in the maternal blood. And it was even pointed out to me that if you go back to 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 the photographs of Dr. Hertig from the 60s, who looked at series of hysterectomies and found early pregnancies in early stages, they said you could actually see this kind of structure. So then the argument with how could you argue, David, that the configuration of this plexiform, the superficial part of the plexiform AVM in the decidua is what guides the topology of villus growth. How could you say that, David? We see from Hertig's pictures that it's pre-existing in this sort of syncytial layer that surrounds the inner cell mass. So I went and I looked at Hertig's photographs, and that's not my interpretation. So I want to back up my claim that invasion of the distal spiral arteries that the distal, the part that's most luminal, I want to back up my claim that invasion of the distal spiral arteries by the extra villus trophoblast really have a creative mandate to create the maternal space of the placenta and link it to these superficial plexiform flaccid low resistance vessels and also that the actual, but that the AVM, you know, uh, flow kinetics are actually created more so by these deeper anastomoses. I want to back that up on three lines. One, by making my counter argument by re-examining Hertig uh, of the em his comments on the em his his pictures of the embryonic phase. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Is I'm going to um, create a counter argument, a counter structural argument, how I interpret the embryonic phase, how I interpret this, looking at real life photos of Hertigs, but I'm not going to show them here, I'm just going to go through them conceptually. So that's one, and that'll argue that the um, sort of teleology of the extra villus trophoblast is creational, as a, is creati creating the space for the placenta to grow, as opposed to creating the proper fluid dynamics for the placenta. The next thing that I'll base that argument on is a case of placenta accreta, where we actually see, you know, the uterus itself. And we could make this case better if we were to get more cases of postpartum hysterectomy, but those specimens are hard to come by. And then I'll also talk about the implications of this on fluid flow modeling. But I think I'll stop this um, first, um, first clip here, and I'll go through that on a second clip. So this will be part one, and then I'm going to create a part two.